Church, I've titled this message as we continue at least one more week on hearing God, how to keep your heart from being hard. Amen. Hearing God. I, I, I feel like I need to say this every week, but I think I need to drill it into us till we get it. God wants to speak to you. Do you understand that? Amen. He doesn't want to just use a hired holy man, a preacher. God wants to speak to you. And if you're a Christian, he is speaking to you. God is talking to you way more than you think. He wants to give you wisdom to make good choices, wisdom in your marriage, how to communicate to your spouse, wisdom as a child, how to respond to your parents, wisdom as a parent, how to minister to your kids and understand the, the goofy things they're going through. And, and, and God is speaking to you if you'll learn to Tune in and listen to what he has to say. He'll use you in powerful ways. So as we get started this morning, hearing God, how to keep your heart tender, how to keep your heart from being God. You know, hearing God is really the basis, if you're a Christian, the reason you read the Bible, hopefully, is to what? Hear what God has to say. You're learning about his character. You're learning about his nature. You're learning about what pleases God and, and what grieves God. The reason you would go to a prayer meeting is not just to talk to God, <laughs> but hopefully you go and pray with somebody to not just talk to God, but also to what? To hear what God has to say to you. It's not a one-way conversation where you're doing all the talking uh, in fact, if you look in the book of Acts, we don't have time. I'll chase rabbits forever. We'll never get out of here. But the first evangelistic uh, missionary thrust came when the, the leaders got together. They were praying and the Lord said, separate unto me, Paul and Barnabas. Set, set aside these people here for, for the gospel to take a missionary trip. They heard that during a prayer meeting. The, the reason that you do these things is to hear God. And so you have a word from God for the moment. What do I need to do here? As I said before, the early church, in a weird way, had an advantage over us. The Bible didn't really become canonized till somewhere around 400-ish. So they didn't carry around 39 scrolls of the Old Testament. They didn't have a book form like we did, right? So what they would do is they would read the Word of God, but they didn't carry around 39 scrolls. They were very dependent upon the Holy Spirit. So once they left their home or wherever they, they were at, they had to then listen to the Holy Spirit. How do I respond to this person? What do I say? How do I pray for this person? God, do you want me to witness? Do you want me just to be their friend? How do I speak to my wife? They were much more dependent upon the Holy Spirit than, than we are today. That doesn't have to be true. But it, 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 as you read the example, the model of the early church, they were much more sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit than we are. So I want us to jump in this morning, and as we continue talking about how to hear from God, now we're going we're gonna to see a negative example. And as we read this, uh, I hope that you see yourself in there, because these people are no different than us. Uh, it's a sad chapter in Israel. In fact, I think I have a map. You can take a look at the map. And uh, when they were in bondage for like 400 years because of the rebellion, uh, Egypt came and, and took the, uh, the Jewish people, made them slaves for a long time. And you can look at that map, and they were there in Egypt. Remember, God delivered them on the Passover. And if you'll look at that map, and uh, it would take under two weeks to make that journey from right there, Egypt. See that top left? Sukkoth, Ramses, right around that area, to go to Canaan, right over there, Jericho. If they would have just cut across, they would have made the journey in a couple of weeks. Just a reminder, how long was the journey? It was how long? 40 years. It should have been less than what? Two weeks. And remember, I shared before, the reason it was 40 years is because they didn't believe God. God said, guys, 12 spies, you leaders of, of your tribes, go and make a plan to defeat your enemies. And 10 came back, and I mean, 40 came back and said, what? No way, we can't do it. Joshua and Caleb said, what? Yeah. We got it, man. We got it. God said, go make a plan. I've got a plan. And, and, the, and they voted. That's what happens when you vote. <laughs> God always loses. Every time in the Bible they vote, God always loses. God doesn't work through the majority. And so if, if they had to listen to Joshua and Caleb, it would have been a short journey. But unfortunately, because they didn't, they were given how many years of the journey? Man, would you be ticked off if you were Joshua and Caleb? 
I'd be whooping some rear end. I'm going to say, you know what? I'm having a, a 40 year journey. It should have been 11, 14 days because you guys didn't believe God, but these guys were, had a different spirit. They were humble and meek. And so we're going to look at 40 years. It should have been a short journey. And what God is saying to you is listen, uh, you don't have to stumble for a long time. You don't have to miss God and be out in the wilderness for a long time because uh, it can really be a short journey. But if you'll listen to my voice, the Lord is saying, I'll bless you. I'll bless your socks off, as we say in our culture today. So let's jump in and let's break down this passage. And really, he lists five things that we have to be careful. Five waxes, so to speak, in your ear that'll block you from hearing God. And he gives five that we have to be careful of, be sensitive to, because if we're not sensitive, we will not be able to hear from God. Uh, verse 6, let's start with verse 6. As he says this, now these things... What Israel went through as they traveled became our examples to the intent that we should not, what? Lust after evil things as those church members did. Now, we're going to go back and forth on these five things, and we're going to look at the Old Testament passage where he's uh, referring to. And there, and look at that picture. There's the manna that's coming from heaven. A manna was like a, some, was like a pancake, and it had like a sweet little taste to it. And and let me tell you how good God was, because they were traveling from that map that we saw there, Ramses all the way to like, you know, near Canaan, the promised land. Uh, There was not a lot of Walmarts and rallies and McDonald's to stop at, right? And so as they're traveling, there's no gardens. You don't have time to plant a garden because you're only going to, you're going to move 10, 12, 15 miles, and then you're going to stop. And and so God did something wonderful. He provided uh, curb, uh, what do you call it? Uh, DoorDash. Yeah, God did DoorDash or Uber driver, and he, he had food just basically rain down. And when they woke up in the morning, there are these little pancake kind of, uh, it's called manna, which means what is it? And that's what they said, what is it? And God provided for them food for a couple of meals a day. And just think, ladies, you'd have loved it. No cooking. You don't have to worry about running out of you know margarine or milk or any of that stuff. The food was there. God provided for them. And here's, here's the, 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 the ear blockage, the wax. And it says this, go to uh, Numbers. You don't have to you go to if you have your Bible or you can look up on the screen. This is the reference that he's talking to. Very clearly, verse 6, now these things are examples to the intent that we should not lust. Now, most of us, when we think of lust, we think of sexual. And that's one aspect but a very small aspect of lusting. Lusting, yeah, can be, uh, uh, you know, looking inappropriately upon the opposite sex with, with desire that's not wholesome and appropriate. If you're married, that's totally different. But in this passage, when we think of lust, we think of sexual, but it's, that's not what it's referring to. If you'll look at uh, Numbers chapter 11, verses 4 through 6, this is what it says. Now the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to what? What does it say? So they didn't just, you ever, come on, tell the truth. You ever, it's been late in the, or any time, you just have a hankering for Chinese food or Mexican food. Anybody just, you know what I'm saying? You just really want, come on, tell the truth and shame the devil, right? There's times where you just, or you really want a hamburger. It's late. They say, come on, who's, honey, if you'll drive, I'll pay for it, right? You got, you want this burger. You want a taco. You want Mexican food. Honey, let's go get Mexican food. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. But the children of Israel got tired of eating manna. And so look at their attitude towards God. Now, God has made it as easy as possible to eat. In fact, he even said, if you on Saturdays, I don't want you to work on Sunday. That's a holy day. It's not a suggestion. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, separate. Don't, don't allow the Lord's day to be like the rest of the days where you do whatever you want to and you just cram a church service in. Let that be a day of rest of recreating your mind, of spending time with God, of slowing down and being still. That's not a suggestion. That's a commandment from God. Don't don't miss it to do all these other things in life. You're, You're outside the will of God. You're in sin. And so he made it very easy. He provided all the food. And yet this is the response of the people. They they yielded to intense craving. And the children of Israel also, they what? 
that's almost comical. <laughs> I want to rally his cheeseburger. I'm so tired of the manna. I mean, it's almost comical. These are grown adults, and they're crying. They, they just can't believe that God would have them do this. Well, the, they've forgotten. First of all, you were in Egypt because you'd rebelled and brought other gods before you. And number two, you were in Egypt. And who delivered you out of Egypt? <laughs> Yet how quickly do we forget? And they begin to cry out and they begin to then weep. Look, the children of Israel also wept again and said, who will give us what? I want me. That's it. You know, saying, is that an Arby's commercial? We've got the beef. Yeah, we got the meat. Yeah, they would have loved Arby's. We've got the meats. And, and they would have said, Moses, you don't got the meats, right? Who will give us meat to eat? And then we remember the fish. Okay, I can see that, which we ate freely in Egypt. And the cucumbers. Uh, how many people say, man, I love to go to your house to eat cucumbers, right? And then, okay, the second, third one I can see, melons, right? If they were good tasting melons. But look at the others. We remember the what? The leeks. Have you ever tasted a leek? I, well, I don't even want to say what I think of when I think of a leek. But anyway, the leeks, I mean, there's just like a funny green little, like an onion kind of a, a garlicky. We remember, we remember how good the leeks were, the onions and the what? And the garlics. Now, you know you're messed up when you're hankering for onions and garlics and leeks. You're just, you just want to complain. And yet, this is one of the biggest sins of humans. This isn't just Israel. This isn't them complaining that God had blessed them and they wanted more, more, more. And they said, but now our whole being is dried up. Lord, we're shriveling away. And there is nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. You want to hear from God? Here's the first thing that you have to always be careful of. Listen. Because if that whole generation did, then who, who are you and I to think we've escaped that? The first thing I want to say to you is this. When God says, don't lust, listen when God says to you, don't lust. When your flesh says, lust, want more, more, and more, more, God says, be content. Listen, it's so hard to hear from God when you're saying, i got to have a big Buford. And if all your content, listen very carefully, go back to that verse. Now, these things are examples to the intent that we should not lust after what kind of things? What kind of things? Is food evil? And the answer is not. No, food is not evil. Well, I guess if it's onions, uh, to me, onions, uh, garlic. Joanne says, I put garlic. I just, I cut up such small pieces. You don't see it. I said, don't you ever do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Smells bad. <laughs> garlic. So as we're looking at this passage, it says uh, we should not lust after evil things. Now, remember this. They're traveling, right? They don't have a million things with them. They're not stopping off at stores and fast food restaurants. How many evil things can you lust after when you got a tent and you're just staying in it? You know what I'm saying? And just going a little bit. So food is not evil. Then why did God say evil things? If he's talking about food, at least in this passage, not just relegated to food only. Because anything that you crave and desire that God hasn't provided becomes evil in your heart. Because it's what consumes you. Even if it's something good like food. You can be consumed by things. You can be consumed by something that's necessary. You can be consumed by money that might be needed. You can be consumed by a lot of things. They're evil only in the sense that you have made it evil because you are craving for it and you're not grateful for what God has already given you. The first truth I want to share with you is as you're learning to hear from God. When God says, don't lust, when God says, do not lust, crave these things, when your, fresh, when your flesh says lust, God says, be content. In America, we lust after the good life. We lust after the easy life. All the commercials put away a tons of money so you can retire early and live the good life. 
We lust after relaxation. We lust after entertainment. And all those things in and of themselves have a place and they're not wrong, but they become evil because our heart is set upon those things. And where your treasure is, there will your heart also be. And you can't hear from God when you're trying to hear from the world. First thing I want to share with you as we learn to hear from God is that we don't lust after things. If God has not provided for it, then perhaps he doesn't want you to have it. Here's the second truth that I want to share with you. Keep reading there after verse 6 and going into verse 7. And do not become what? Idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to what? And they rose up to play. The passage he's referring to there is Exodus 32. You can turn there, 1 through 6, or you can look up on the screen or do both if you want to. That way you can, if you've got your Bible, you can circle it and highlight it and things the Lord might be saying to you during this time as we study his word. This is a reference to when Moses came down. He went up on the, on the Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments. Remember that. To seek the Lord, to hear from God. God called him up there. Well, Moses took a little bit too long. See, everybody loves one-hour church service. <laughs> In and out, quick, quick. Well, Moses didn't do the one-hour church service to fit, accommodate people's time so they could squeeze God in and do what they want to the rest of the day. And so they got a little ticked off. So look, look at Exodus 32, 1 through 6. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron, his brother, and said to him, Come, let's make gods that shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, they should have stopped there and said, Hey, we're grateful. <laughs> the guy set us free. He risked his life for us. No, 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 no. As for this Moses, what? He prays too much. That guy, what's, what's, well, he does is spend time praying, right? He's, he's interceding for your life, buddy. You better be grateful he's up there getting the commands from the Lord. And so they're saying, we don't even know what's happening to this guy. He's up there just lollygagging, spending too much time praying. And so it says there in verse 2, And Aaron said to them, well, this is a good brother, real spiritual. Break off golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters. That's interesting. And and bring them to me. So all the, if you ever get mad, dad, that your uh, sons are wearing earrings, actually, it sounds like they did there too, right? So it's not a commercial for that, but they had earrings, right? At some point. Uh, So all the people broke off the golden earrings that were in the ears. They brought them to Aaron. He received the gold from their hand and he fashioned it. Now, this was premeditated. This, he fashioned it. This wasn't a throw it in and it just popped out. This was a skill. This, he took his time doing this. And he, uh, he fashioned it with an engraving tool and he molded a what? Yeah. Right? That's a, that calf you see on the Chick-fil-A commercials. Maybe it kind of looked like that one, right? Then they said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Now, how stupid can we become as humans? How quick do we forget so they make this golden calf and said, this is your God. Well, we're no different. Hey, there's our God, money and sex and sports and our kids and all the stuff. We do the same thing. We're making gods out of something that's not a God. So when Eretz saw it, he built then an altar before. So he, he then he built up an altar, right, to put it on. Like you think of an altar at a church. They're going all out on this golden calf. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow is a what? Now, this Aaron loved the Lord, but you see how easily you can be influenced by people? I mean, he loved Jesus. He he was tight with his brother. He was his brother's voice. Aaron kind of had a speech impairment. Aaron was a little bit more glib, a a better communicator, more fluid. And and, and Moses probably stuttered. And so, remember, he used the excuse. God says, okay, well, I'll, I'll let Aaron be your spokesman. And all of a sudden, everybody starts coming against uh, uh, Moses. And instead of Aaron taking a stand, guess what Aaron does? He capitulates. He gives in. He compromises. Let me tell you this. Very careful. Be careful who you choose to be really close to you. Because they're either going to rub off on you. uh, And if you don't rub off on them, then it's not going to be good. And Aaron, all of a sudden, just does a a turn about. (laughs) And so... He made a proclamation, tomorrow's a feast for the Lord. Then they rose early the next day, they offered burnt offerings, and they brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat, drink, and they rose up to play. Uh, in the immortal words of some of those uh, 
KC and the Sunshine Band. Do a little dance. Oh, no, no, wait a minute. <laughs> no, no, let me think of another one. Uh, let's see, uh, the Commodores. Uh, no, I better not do that one either. Okay, bottom line is they, uh, they, uh, they were just getting down and getting whirly, and Aaron, as much as he knew God, gave in, and he began to compromise, and, and they made this like a, a church service. And, and this is mind-boggling, this... The, the, that we as the people of God can drift that far, that quick. Neither be idolaters. Listen, an idol is not a statue of Buddha or Muhammad or Confucius. It's anything that you have made prime importance. Like the previous point, uh, you can make an idol out of something very good. People make an idol out of their work to where your work is where you get all your self-esteem. I read a story of a guy, and he was talking about his dad, and his dad was a very uh, well-known, he had seminars, he spoke, and they they charged like $100, he'd get 10,000 people. He said, but his dad was so cheap, he wouldn't even pay for their kids to have haircuts. And all this hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars, and yet he felt so good, look at me, I'm a big shot at my job, and, and you can make your job an idol. In America, I've seen, in, even in the church, I've seen people make their kids an idol. And it doesn't matter if it's Sunday. If there's something going on, they'll just miss, 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 miss. doesn't matter. The Sabbath is no longer holy for them. And they make their kids. Now, they really bow down and they worship their kids. I'll never forget a man said to me many years ago, his kid was really good in sports. I was like an eight or nine-year-old. He was on a, they have traveling teams now. Didn't have that when I was a kid. And the traveling team, his kid made it. That means you travel. You don't just play a little league game here in your town. You travel to other cities all over the state, sometimes Tennessee or Indiana across the border. And he said to me, my son made the travel team. And so from now, April through August, we'll be traveling. Just want to let you know. So if I'm not here, I'll only be here a couple of times when we're not traveling on the weekend. So that when I'm not here, you know that you know, we're on the road. So you're going to teach your kid at eight years old, you come to church when it's convenient, when you don't have a softball game. And do you wonder, want to know why your kid has been lost for so long? Because you taught him sports or whatever activity is more important than God. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it. That's, do you understand? That's not the 10 suggestions. That's the 10 what? That that means if somebody was to murder every day and tell you I'm a Christian, what would you say to them? Because that's one of the Ten Commandments. If someone is to neglect the Sabbath day and only come when it's convenient for them, then what should you say to them as well? You can't pick and choose which command you can say. "That's That's a sign of a lost person. The fact that you love your entertainment, your sports, your hobby, or any of those things more than God tells me that's your idol, that's your God. And God will not play second fiddle to your sport, your band, or anything else. Now tell me if I'm lying or tell me if I'm not telling you what the Word of God says. You've got an idol in your life and your idol is your child. Your child did not die on the cross for your sins. Jesus did. And you keep doing that and wonder why they don't know God when they're 30 or 40 or 50 years old. It's not their fault. It's your fault. Let me tell you one of the hardest decisions I had to make. When we moved here, um, I didn't know they had all these, they start t-ball, all these real early, right? I mean, young, crazy young. Well, my son Elijah wanted to play, and he was already like seven or eight or nine years old. He's like four years behind everybody. Well, he caught up and was really good after a couple of years. And the coaches came up to me and said, we'd like to pick your son to play All-Stars, but we realize that sometimes when we have Sunday practice, you don't show up and you tell us why. And we don't want to pick your son to be on the All-Stars if... We have tournaments, you know, the All-Stars, if you, you play on a sa- Friday or Saturday, if you're good and your team makes it, the championships are often on a Sunday. And say, we don't want to pick your kid if on Sunday you don't show up because I know you're a pastor of a church. And I'm telling you, that's one of the hardest decisions I've ever made in my life. Because I want my kid to, you know, be on the All-Star team and play. And, and the, I mean, that was, I loved it when I was a kid doing all that and traveling and, you know, and advancing down in Texas. And so... I thought, I want him to play, but I'm a pastor of a church. So they said, can you tell us what decision you'll make? And that was the hardest decision I ever had to make. I said, well, it's Sunday, and you know, I'm sorry, but I'm a pastor of a church, and if you have a 9, 10, 11, 12 o'clock game, he can't be there. 
And so they said, thanks, I, I appreciate it. And so they picked another guy. And I remember when we leave her at church, a couple of weeks, we'd drive down the baseball field, and I'd drive real slow so I could see if, <laughs> what the score was. I could see the scoreboard. That's one of the hardest decisions I've ever had to make. But this is something I learned. It didn't bother my son as much as it bothered me. That's when it really bothered me. He was okay. He said, that's okay, Dad. I, I understand. You know, it's Sabbath day. It bothered me. I had more pride than he did. See, a lot of times we try to live our life vicariously through our kids. And we want them to do well because we want to have the joy and the excitement. <laughs> and the Lord changed it the next year that we came up with a compromise. But my point is, what's an idol in your life? It's something good that you've made God out of it. Amen. And for a lot of you, it's not going to be alcohol or drugs or any of those things. Your idol can be your spouse. Your idol can be your job. Your idol can be a lot of things that in and of themselves are okay. But you now worship it. What's the second truth they want to share with you? Listen when God says, place no idols before me. When your flesh says, worship more than God, God says, I'm sufficient for you. When your flesh says, worship more than God, they couldn't hear God. You think they could hear God when they're trying to worship a, a golden calf? And as long as you're worshiping something other than Jesus, you'll never fully ever hear his voice. You know, there's so many par parallels, and I don't have enough time to get into the things that Egypt, uh, the, uh, the Israelites did and how it paralleled with, with Jesus. And, but I'll just say this. As they were heading to the promised land, the promised land is not heaven here, right? Oh, the promised land is heaven. No, it isn't because Moses didn't make it to the promised land, and we know he made it to heaven, Right? The promised land is the full life, living off the promises of God, living that abundant life, that life filled with the Spirit of God. And as you look at this passage, not a whole lot of these church folks live the Spirit-filled life. And I say this to you because I want you to walk in the fullness of God. I want you, this doesn't matter what I do. If I become a hypocrite and I become an atheist, you walk with God. You know God. It doesn't matter what anybody else does. You know God. Walk with Him. Walk in the blessing sings the joy and walk in the fullness and the abundance of life because God has a greater plan for you than you have for yourself. And that's what God's trying to say. I'm trying to speak to you, but you can't when you have an idol in this world. Here's the third truth that I want to share with you. Keep reading. Look at verse uh, 8. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, what? 20, God... 23,000 died. What's the reference there? The reference there is Numbers. Go to that one real quick. You can turn in your Bibles to Numbers 25. And just for the sake of time, each one of these could be a sermon, but we're just looking at things that, that keeps us from really hearing from God. Neither let us commit, sex, uh, commit fornication, as some of them committed, but fell uh, in one day uh, 23,000. Let me say this quickly. Fornication and adultery, very similar. Fornication is two single people having sex outside of marriage. That's fornication. Adultery is if one of the two or both are married, not to each other, come together and have sex. That's called adultery. And it's not just talking about the acts, but you can be just as guilty if you're just letting it run wild in your mind and not stopping those thoughts. In fact, you never commit adultery or fornication until you've done it in your mind. If you stop it here, you'll never do the physical act. That's why Jesus emphasizes the heart. You control your heart and you won't do it. It's kind of like you don't accidentally rob a bank, right? You come home from lunch. Honey, what's that suitcase? Well, I don't know, honey. I was going to go to McDonald's to get lunch and I decided to rob a bank. It's just $100,000 in my briefcase. You don't accidentally rob a bank. You premeditate. You don't accidentally fool around with somebody. You were thinking about it and the door finally opened and you weaseled your way into it. So here we God is about the heart, my friend. It's not about the act. And so this is what he says. Now, Israel remained in Acacia Grove, and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. And they invited the people to the sacrifices. So once they got involved, that's why you try to date somebody that's lost, they're going to bring you down to their world. They're going to bring you back down to partying and relaxing and goofing around and all that stuff. Satan will get you on the installment plan. 
So then they invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods rather than the only true God. And the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined to Baal of Peor. And the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel just for the sake of time. Uh, the plague hit. And those who died in the plague were... Another version says 23,000. See, the Bible has discrepancies. No, it doesn't. One says 24,000. One says 23,000. If you look at the passage, 1,000 were hanged. That means they didn't die by the plague. They were hung. And it doesn't say in one day, one said 23,000, 24,000 means they died the next day or three days later. So all these so-called discrepancies has nothing to do with truth. It has everything to do with people trying to disprove the Bible and refusing to read it slowly, and the explanation is there. So how do we, how do we keep from hearing God when I have my mind? Listen, sex is not from the devil. You understand this. Sex is not the devil idea. It's God's idea. Sex is a beautiful, beautiful expression of love between a married man and a married woman to each other. Everything out of that, you're begging God to deal with you. I think of a lot of the sexually transmitted disease that have happened in our nation. I think of AIDS and where it started from. So, listen, how many of you are parents? Right here, raise your hand. How many of you want a, a guy in this community to go start fooling around with your daughter and seduce her and, and uh, do things to her? Raise your hand, you want that. Then that girl that you're thinking of doing something with, that's God's daughter, get your hand off of her. Amen. And that man you're thinking that he's a lot nicer to you than your husband, get your hands off of him. That's God's son. He'll deal with you. See, we've lost the fear of God in the church. When you can attend church for years and years and years and never be bothered by it, you are in a very dangerous, backslidden place. Here's the third truth. You know why it's hard to hear from God? You know why we can't hear Him? Because... Our mind is lusting on something that's not wholesome and pure. That means if you're single and God, you're not married, then you wait and you ask God, listen to me. You show me, I mean, I've told men this over and over over the decades in my office. If you're single and you want to get married, that's normal. It's not good that man should be alone. We have an Achilles heel as men, and that's women. And I like women so much, I picked one out and married her 30-some years ago, right? But listen. You keep your heart pure because getting married is not the answer to your problems with lust. Because if you're struggling with lust, and you have you seen these Hollywood guys? They got unbelievable blonde, uh, uh, bombshells for wives. How come most of them are having affairs? Because marriage is not the answer to lust, my friend. It's, and so if I can stay pure in my heart when I'm single, if I get married, I'll be content with that, and I won't want her plus one other thing. Marriage will not solve the problems of lust. Right. Knowing God and allowing Him to curb those desires will. Lord, you're doing something in my life while I'm single. You're teaching me how to be godly and pure. You're teaching me how to say no to my flesh. Any two dogs in a back alley can do what you're doing. It takes a man or a woman of God to say, Lord, I have this need. Would you be sufficient for me until you bring that spouse into my life? And you know I'm telling the truth on that. And in the church, the reason the world laughs at us, because they say, you're no different than us. We fool around, have adulterous and fornication. You guys do it too. You just throw your hands up and say, thank you, Jesus, at church. And there's no difference between you and us. Why even go to church? Here's number three, why we don't hear God. Listen, when God says to you, sex is for marriage only. When, you're, when your flesh says sex outside of marriage will feel good, God is saying to you, no, it won't. Maybe for that day, maybe for those few hours, maybe as you're anticipating that, that rendezvous, but God is saying to you, you will regret this. Don't do it. You can't hear from God when your mind and your ears are caught up with, I can't wait for this rendezvous, and you will have a rendezvous with God. That's his son or daughter that you're thinking of doing something with. You treat them with respect. Don't touch them till you marry them. Here's number four in your outline. How do we hear from God? How do we keep our heart tender? Look at this passage, verse 9. 
Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and they were destroyed by what? Destroyed by the venomous serpents. Saying this is a problem that we have as people, and the problem that the church, the, the Israelites had. What is he referring to? He's referring to Numbers 21. Let's read this quickly. Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around to the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on, this, on, on the way they were traveling. And the people spoke against who? God and? Which is kind of funny because you got perhaps the greatest man in the Old Testament. A man who risked their lives. Remember, he was raised in the Pharaoh's court. This guy had all everything before him. He had luxury. He had royalty, the best food. But he chose when he, he knew he was a Jewish man. Remember the whole story? We don't have time to, to, to go back into it. But he left the comforts of the great, the easiest life that any person could have in all of Egypt, which is kind of the U.S. of that time, the most prosperous nation. He left it so he could be with his people and deliver them from their bondage. Now, Paul is having this problem with the Corinthian church. I want you to think about this. Perhaps the greatest man that ever lived in the New Testament that we know of, the Apostle Paul, there in Corinth, and they're complaining about his leadership. And then you got Moses and all the people of God are complaining about his leadership. What does that tell you about how the average church member knows how to pick a church? <laughs> Can you imagine Jesus coming or Apostle Paul coming to E-Town and starting and, and pastoring here and everybody going to the church because they have all these kind of stuff going on? That tells me, I, I can tell a lot about your walk with God by the church you picked. <laughs> and so here's Moses laying his life down for these people. And, and, and look what it's saying here in this passage. And verse 5, and the people spoke against God and against what? Moses, if, duh, 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 yeah, they, they all know about leading an entire nation. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water and our soul loathes this worthless bread. Man, they are just flapping their gums and going. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents for us. And you know what most people would have done? Heck with you. That's what you get. <laughs> let the serpents bite, bite more of you. But Moses was not like that. He didn't hold grudges. He let it go. He realized that as an adult parent dealing with children in the Lord, that they were going to be foolish and make stupid choices. And so Moses, what? He prayed for the people. It was the compassion, that love that he had for the people of God. Verse 8, then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent, set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent. He put it on a pole, and so it was. If a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, guess what? He what? He lived. And that's almost a picture there of a serpent being snake or representing sin. Jesus took our sin. Look up to the cross, and you'll be forgiven. There's that Old Testament, New Testament parallel right there. And so God had to make this bronze serpent. He put it up on like on a cross, on a pole, and he hung it there and said, those of you that by faith will look up, if you do that, God will heal you. That's the Old Testament parallel. Neither, let's don't be like those who tempted Christ, as some of them also tempted, and they were destroyed by the serpents. Here's the fourth truth that I want to start sharing is that we have a cheap gospel in America. It's a gospel that has taken grace to a, a sinful place. It's a cheap grace. It's a grace that says, you know what? I can do this and that and God will forgive me. God's a loving God. God's a merciful God. God's a God of grace. And so therefore, I will do this. I know that it's wrong, but hey, God's obligated to forgive me. We have a saying in our culture, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for so I don't want to ask for permission because you might say no, so I'm going to do it anyway. And when you approach me, I'll say, oh, I'm so sorry. And you're a Christian. You're supposed to forgive me. So I'll go around doing whatever I want to do. And if I get caught, I'll say, you're a Christian. Where is your Christian love? You're supposed to forgive me. That's not the grace the Bible talks about. Amen. In fact, there's a couple of scripture verses. Do we have them up there? Romans 6, 2. Do we have one of those passages up there? Yeah, there's some good, uh, good verses there. What shall we say then, Romans 6, 2? Shall we continue in sin so I can show you what a gracious God he is? I'm going to sin so I can say, see, God's a God of grace. 
And in the Greek there, it's a, a triple, like a negative. No, never, certainly not, certainly not. How can, shall we who died to sin, we're now saved, how, how should we continue to live in it? Hebrews 12 says it this way. My son, don't despise the what? When God chastens you, he's got to deal with you. He's got to, he's got to, sometimes you're being chastened because you're in error. You're, you're, you're sin sometimes because you're just going through a testing time and God's purifying you. There's a pruning. My son, don't despise the chastening of the Lord. Don't be discouraged when God has to rebuke you. For whom the Lord loves, what? Hey, you know one of the most dangerous place to be? When you can continue to sin and not be bothered by it. That means it could be that God has taking his hand off you, and you are now a reprobate. You are now at a place where you're not even bothered by your sin anymore. See, the Christian in sin is the most miserable person because he knows Christ, but he can't enjoy the world, but he keeps trying to flirt with the world. He's, conv he's condemned, he's or convicted by the Lord, and yet the world can't totally satisfy him, but he's not turning to God for deliverance and help. And you're, you'll be at the most miserable place of all people. A totally lost person, he doesn't know the Lord, he thinks he's enjoying it, he don't have any guilt, his conscience is seared. And if you can continue to sin and not be bothered by it, why do you even come to this church? Go someplace where somebody's going to tickle your ears. And if you want that kind of church, you'll find it, believe me. The church of what's happening now is there. And if you're not bothered by it, you're at a dangerous, dangerous place. If God has stopped speaking to you, you're at the most dangerous place in your life. For whom the Lord loves, He chastens and He scourges. What? Every son who he has received. Listen to me. There's a cheap grace being taught that basically just go ahead and do it and God will forgive you. And I'm here to say to you, that is not biblical. Amen. See, this, in this world, if your parents are very wealthy or your parent is connected to the police department or the chief or a top guy or he's a mayor or the mayor council or your, your dad's a sharp attorney, listen to me, a lot of times you'll go to court and guess what? You can get away with it. You get a really sharp, sharp law, a liar, I mean lawyer. <laughs> you get a really good one. He can get you off. A guy that's slick, he can get you off, but you can't get off before God like that. And you can tempt God. Lord, I dare you. I dare you. I'm going to do this. And God will say, don't do it, son. I love you and I will deal with you. You'll have wished that you didn't do that. I've talked to people oftentimes, different things. They keep uh, several times guys that just keep mistreating their wife. And I'll say, listen, friend, you keep doing that. You're going to lose your wife. You better stop now. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn my life to Jesus. Listen to me. You can turn your life to Jesus, but you better hope your wife's heart is not hardened because if you burned her enough, she well, she's supposed to. Well, whether she's supposed to or not, you treat her like trash. If she no longer, if she's hardened her heart to you, your marriage is over. Here's number four. Never tempt God to judge us because he will. Don't put God to the test. Let God put you to the test. You're not here to tempt God to deal with you. You're to plead for mercy. That's number four. You know why you can't hear from God? Because God won't speak to you when you're thinking about doing those kind of things. God won't speak to you when you say, you know what? God will forgive me. And I can hear God saying, forgiveness is not the issue. I'm going to deal with you. Never tempt God to judge us because God will. Let me give you one more. How do we hear from the Lord? Well, these are four examples that, that will block us from hearing God. <clears throat> Look at uh, verse 10. Neither what? That's an interesting, you don't hear that a lot. That's, isn't that hard to believe that that's a, a sin, a serious sin that blocks us from hearing God? Neither murmur, as some of them also murmured, and they were what? They were destroyed by the destroyer. There off, often means uh, perhaps in, as the, uh, the, the angel of death, the death angel that would come. Uh, as we see when, when uh, God said, put the blood over the doorpost, over the top and the side post. And that's a picture of the cross. 
You, the blood of Jesus right here, here. And if the blood is covering you, God will pass over you. So the Passover has to do with God because you've been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. You've asked him to forgive you. The, the Jewish people, if they put the blood over their door, that's the New Testament picture of you then placing the blood of Christ over your life. And Satan has to pass over you. He cannot touch you because you belong to him. There's the Old Testament and the New Testament picture. But no murmur, some of them also murmured and would destroy. I was looking up different interpretations for that word murmur. And one of them says, it's to complain under your breath. There was a, I forgot that cartoon, Smugly or something like that. And he'd always, you know, Muttley. Yeah, thank you, brother. Thank you, Lamont. Muttley, yeah. He was always, you know, you're smart enough not to murmur in front of people. But you wait till you get out the door and get in the car and you start talking to your spouse about the things wrong in the church. Ooh, that's not you, right? You've never done that. I've always said, Lord, help me because as a pastor, I deal with people who a lot of times would become bitter and angry and rebellious and and help me not to always let my kids hear about the problems in the church because I don't want them to have a bad attitude regarding church folk because sometimes people harden, they harden their hearts. They become bitter. Help me to be careful, Lord, with the words I say in front of my children regarding the body of Christ. Neither murmur, some of them also murmured, and they were destroyed by the destroyer. Where is that passage found? That's found in Numbers 14. Look at that. And on that day, all the congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, saying, You have killed the people of the Lord. Yeah, Moses, it's all your fault, right? Now it happened when the congregation had gathered against Moses and Aaron that they turned towards the tabernacle of meeting, and suddenly the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. Then Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of the meeting. They had, they had complained and bad mouth, and God says, That's it. That's it, Moses and Aaron. Verse 44. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, What? Moses, get out of the way. You've been interceding for the people, but I'm going to deal with them, son. What a, Moses was just a, such a godly man. One time it said he fell on his face, interceding, Lord, have mercy upon them. Or we'd have said, stick it to them, God, after the way they've treated me. I'm so encouraged in a weird way when I read about Moses and Paul. And you thought everybody says, oh, man, they're great men. But, man, they, they, people came against them all the time. I think, how could you come against? It's like saying Michael Jordan is not a good basketball player. It's like, are you kidding me? He's the best in the world. You got Moses. You got, you got Paul. But you also had Jesus, and look what they did to him. Careful about putting your hope in people. People will break your heart. You look to Christ. So God says, get away from the congregation that I may what? Look at verse 44. That I may consume them in a moment. And and what did Moses and Aaron do? What, What humble people, Lord, please, God, don't, Lord, don't. They're stupid, they're foolish, they're ignorant, but Lord, have mercy upon them. And I thought, those are special men. Men that have tender hearts. I thought, Lord, I would love to have a tenth of what those men had. So Moses then said to Aaron, take a censer and put fire on it in the altar and incense on it. And take it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them. For There always has to be somebody making atonement. And praise the Lord that Jesus was our atonement once and for all. For wrath has gone out from the Lord. The plague has begun. Then Aaron took it as Moses commanded. He ran into the midst of the assembly and already the plague had begun uh, among the people. So he put up incense and made atonement for the people. Verse 40, and he stood between the dead and the living, so the plague was stopped. Now those who died in the plague were what? 14,700, beside those who died when Korah rebelled against Moses in the Korah incident. And so Aaron returned to Moses at the door of the tabernacle meeting, for the plague had stopped. Wow. Murmuring, complaining. How many of you uh, would put up if somebody came and and kind of criticized and insulted your wife in front of you? Men, what would you do? Well, the church is called the bride of, quit bad-mouthing the church that's trying to do good, and God will deal with you. Well, I'm not saying you don't point out sin. The Bible says that. But be very careful about being harsh in your criticism, not being merciful and gracious in your criticism. 
a complaining spirit. You can't hear from God when you're murmuring and complaining. I remember hearing a guy, he was going uh, bird, uh, do, uh, dove hunting with his uh, neighbor, and they went out, and he kept saying, you need to see my dog. My dog's unreal. I got, I got the best bird dog around. So they go, and his, his uh, neighbor friend, there's a boat, there comes some doves flying, and he shoots with a shotgun, and he nails one of the doves, and it falls down in the water 30, 40 yards away. He says, watch. I've been telling you about my bird. Check him out. So his bird dog gets out of the boat, and it doesn't swim. He steps on the water, and the bird dog goes all the way, walking on the water, grabs the dove, and comes back into the boat. And he's pretty proud, right? The owner, he says, what do you think about my bird dog? He said, ain't much of a bird dog. He can't even swim. <laughs> you see how we criticize? You see how we cut down? We criticize because we're ungrateful. We criticize because we're jealous. Somebody's more anointed, more pretty, more special, wealthier. And all of a sudden, our jealousy, and we come out and we say things that aren't holy and godly. Got a, many, many years ago, a couple came here. The wife loved it here. She wanted to become part of the New Hope and go to the members class. And he was kind of standoffish. You ever met people like, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and so, don't know what his issue was. Some people are... Got to have this version of the Bible. And if you don't have this version of the Bible, you're missing God. And you're compromising doing contemporary songs. That's of the, you know. And so a lot of people have just all kinds of weird issues, right? Uh, and they're big hangups. But uh, so she wanted to come to your members class. Well, obviously, if they're a couple. He's going to have to make this his home church. And he was not on board. I don't, he, like I said, he had some issues with him. But he said, uh, can I look at your new members book? I said, Absolutely. Not many people have ever done that. I say, hey, this guy's a good student. He wants to look at my new member's booklet, study it before we meet, and, and he's ready to go. And so he texts me and says, I've noticed that you have all these things you're expecting from the people of God, but what, are we, what can we expect from you and what you believe? And I said, oh, I share that in new member's class. I said, we're a basic church in the sense of we believe Jesus Christ is Lord, you know, saved by faith. You know, the basic stuff that every church that's solid uh, evangelical church in America believes. I said, but I share that with you, but I'll be glad to put it in print. And in fact, I wound up changing my, to put the basic standard, we believe in Christ. We, you know what I'm saying? The top 20 things every church puts. And I could tell in his letter, he was almost like I was under his microscope. I had better measure up to him. He's the pastor now. And everything he says, and, and I remember saying to him, sir, have you had a bad experience in church? Because it appears to me that everything has to line up. Per and I didn't say it quite all these extra things, but it's almost like I have to meet your approval as if you're the pastor and I have to agree. If you're going to come to church and you're going to have to find a church, you agree everything with the pastor says, then I'm wasting your time. I better say something at some point that challenges you, that causes you to learn, to tweak your theology, because if you have everything down that I'm saying, then I'm an extra person. You know, sometimes you got to say that to people because they're such a Pharisee. They're such a, they're such a scribe and so harsh and no love. Hey, if I'm wrong in something, sit down and show with me. But hey, what, what do you believe? What do you believe? What do you believe? I said, brother, are you coming here to be the pastor or are you coming here to learn? So anyway, long story short, I said, have you had a bad church experience? Did you get burned or hurt somewhere that you just don't trust leadership? And that was it. He sent me a, an email. That's it. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. I'm on my way. And I thought, hallelujah. I wanted to sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Let it flow, Lord. <laughs> Critical spirit. You're here to make sure everybody lines up with you. Then you're in the wrong church. And there's something wrong. You're a critical person. You're criticizing and you're so far from the Spirit of God. Wish I had time to tell you of an experience where God dealt with me many years ago and I didn't realize I had such a critical spirit and, and I was broken over it. And someday maybe I'll share it. But as we begin to wrap it up, they murmured about God and Moses. They murmured about, they had a God that delivered them, got them out of Egypt. He provided food for them. Listen, they had permanent clothes, permanent press. They never had to. You know what I'm saying? It didn't wore out for 40 years. Can you imagine that, women? Wouldn't you love clothes you didn't have to iron? Clothes didn't wear out, had food given to them. They didn't have to order out from a, a, a DoorDash or Uber driver. God protected them. He opened the Red Sea, two big aquariums on both sides. They walked through it. When they got through it, he closed it. God over and over and over and over blessed them, but they kept criticizing. Is that you? 
my husband doesn't make enough money. How come we don't have a nice furniture? How come we don't have a nicer home? How come we don't have a better, how come we don't have more money put away? Is that you? How come this couple has that, but we only have this? Here's the last point. And let me give you one more scripture verse. It's found in Hebrews chapter 3. Look at Hebrews chapter 3, and we'll start kind of just wrapping it up right here. It's a great passage. He's talking about what we just read. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you want, today, if you hear his voice, you're here, you heard God. God said something to you today about you. Not about correcting your kids or your parents or your wife or your husband. Because <laughs> if you come to hear from God, to hear, to change other people, you didn't hear from God. You heard from yourself. That's what you wanted to do. Today, if you will hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as who? The people of God that were walking through the wilderness in the, those 40 years of rebellion. In the day of the trial of the wilderness. Where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw all the wonderful things I did for 40 years. Therefore, I was what? See, we don't, we don't paint that picture of, of God. He's this Santa Claus. So sometimes God says, that's enough. The reason your nation is the way it is is because not the White House, because God's house. We quit preaching the word of God. We start tickling ears, but we didn't make converts. We made church members, half-baked disciples that are half full of the evil one. Where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works for 40 years, and I was angry with, and I said, they always go astray in their hearts. They have not known my ways. They've seen it, but they have not known the ways of God. And I swore in my wrath, says the Lord, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, therefore, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of what? You don't believe God when he says, I'm speaking to you, do this. And departing from the living God. Listen, I don't like to bring hard messages all the time. But the fact of the matter is sometimes the only way we're going to listen is a very blunt, direct message. Amen. I'm here not to beat the sheep, but to feed the sheep. But part of feeding the sheep is warning us. Some of you, you saw yourself in one, maybe two, three of those. Get the wax out of your ear and obey God. You don't want to walk in the blessings of God? God wants to speak to you. So herb, I can't talk to you. Don't we have a saying in our culture? Talk to the hand. God says, I'm trying to talk to you, but you got your eyes on the world. Get it off the world. 